Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Tick, episode 26. So this week guys, we've decided to do something a little bit different. Um, so we're going to be talking about distribution and... Um, film viewing experiences. And film viewing experiences. And um, we're actually, well Sam conducted an interview the other day. Um, he was joined by Vince Diamato, who's part of Darkside. We've also got Sing Lau, who is an organiser of um, Horror on Sea. And we're also joined by Tom Lee Rudder, who has been on podcasts previously, who's a, a fellow film filmmaker of ours that, yeah, we're good friends with. Uh, so, over to Sam. Sam, take it away. I'm on Trash House Take, and we're doing something a little bit different today. We're talking about distribution, and we're talking about cinema experience in early media, such as VHS and DVD. And I'm joined by Tom Lee Rutter. Hi. Vince Diamato. Oh. Hello. And Sing Lal. You all good, guys? Yeah. Hey, yeah, we're good. Yes, thank you. Awesome. So like it, talking about film. Yeah, it's it's, um, it's going to be a bit of a different one, and I just wanted to because obviously right now cinema is one of those things which isn't accessible and shouldn't be accessible right now. I wanted to talk about what cinema kind of means as a as a as as a form of watching a film, how it does have that slight specialness, I guess, to it. I'm going to quickly say um, I was thinking about this earlier when it came to cinema. I was trying to remember like significant films. I was thinking, oh, I could ask you guys about significant films you've seen in cinema. But weirdly for me, like I just remember that transitional point when you're a bit younger. And I had, um, I think it was for me, Lord of the Rings. For other people, it's always Star Wars. But when you watch the first one and you're with your parents, and then it goes to watching the last one with your friends, and it's that weird one. Yeah. You don't have that. You do have that with video and DVD and those kind of at home uh, mediums. But there's something special about it when you go from being to the cinema with your family and then going to, with your friends and with it being in that same franchise. It almost feels like growing up in some way. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, let's uh, let's just uh, share some experiences with cinema in that regards. Uh, Vince. Well, you mean like going to the cinema? Yeah, just like if, uh, if we'll, we'll just go around with like, um, yeah, we'll basically yeah. just go into cinema. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, absolutely, I I agree with you, Sam. And uh, for, firstly, in terms of uh, uh, that, when you have that experience in the cinema. Um, it, it is a more memorable one. Uh, you know, it's it's more of an event. You know, it's, it's a film event, you know, going there, especially going there with your parents and things like that. Uh, I mean, my my favorite experience uh, in, in the cinema, uh, I mean, I, I grew up in, uh, with, with my mom. She, she uh, in the early years of my childhood, uh, she never swore or anything like that. And uh, my, my favorite experience was uh, my godmother, uh, who actually lives in the UK. She uh, she lives out in Tunbridge. Oh. Uh, but but well, in, back when we were all here in Vancouver, she took me and my brother, and I was five years old and he was three years old, uh, to go and see the Blues Brothers. And, wow. you know, when, when we saw that, we were just, we were floored. You know, like the only thing we thought of was, uh, you know, just how energetic it was all the car crashes of course you know up, up until blues brothers 2000 and then after that i think it was gi joe uh rise of cobra uh up up until those two films the blues brothers from 19, 1980 had the most car crashes of any film in in, in <laughs> cinema history and uh it's an amazing uh, sequence. It, yeah and uh so so we were walking by the cinema my mom took drove uh had walked us downtown we were walking by the cinema that we'd seen that and they were still playing it there was a poster for the blues brothers and we stopped we both me and my brother you know pulled my mom back mom 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 can we see this movie it's our favorite movie and she said you saw that movie uh, yeah yeah it's our favorite <laughs> favorite movie so she said okay so she brought us into the movie again we saw it for the second time and then she went and unloaded on my godmother just gave her a shit she's like how could you take them to that movie but, but the thing was is we didn't grow up hearing all these cuss words and so we didn't even know what what it was that's not what we took away from the film so we we still didn't even know what you know all shit and fuck and all this but we had no idea and in fact 
fact, uh, not not just my godmother, not just my mom, but after that, my mom took us again and then uh, uh, to see it. And uh, her first husband, uh, he took us to see it after that. We, we saw that movie when we were kids. We saw that movie three, four, maybe five times in the cinema back wow. in 1980. <laughs> and uh, and it is those things that really stick with you. And the very they have same... a special bond with you and your family. Mm. Uh, well, exactly. That's the thing, you know. And, and uh, you, you, those events, those create those memories you know uh and i remember uh so 25 years after that happened uh so that would have been yeah about two, 2005 that's right yeah 2005 the exact same cinema that that all happened in uh was doing a uh they were playing a retrospective blues brothers oh, thing nice. with from a from a print and i took my mom to go and see that I said, Mom, you got to come Full with circle. me. They're, they're, yeah, they're doing the Blues Brothers. You got to come with me. And she she loved it. She was like, I forgot how good that movie was. You know? Oh. Yeah. So Amazing. It just gets know, everyone dancing, though. You know? Yeah. Oh, totally. Totally. So, you know, it's 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 those types of things that, uh, um, like, even, even VHS, even though there's, like, a lot of good memories around VHS and, and uh, going to the video store, and those become their own experiences as yeah, well yeah. they're really it, it's true there really is nothing quite like doing that kind of event experience in the cinema and i think you're right sam especially when you're younger it's just, it, when you're especially impressionable it's really important you know to to uh, to have those experiences i do i do think that but unfortunately um do i think that the, this is a business that this is going to be something for for other people to enjoy. I I, I have to say I don't. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think it is. You know, I, I wish it, which it could be, but I think I think that that was of an era. You know, and I think that I think the era is changing. It's changing into another yeah. era now. You know? I think. Um, but anyway, that's what I got. That's what I got to say about it. it. In that regard, absolutely, yeah. I totally agree. When you're and, younger, um, but... certain films that you want to see on the big screen, um, but won't get the opportunity to see it uh, on any big screen unless you do something about it yourself now. Mm, um, yeah. Well, a lot of people complain, such as the on, that you can't smoke while sitting in the cinema watching a film like, you know, that you want to see. So, <laughs> yeah. People prefer to shape the uh, experience to their own liking, which is obviously in the comfort of their own home. Mm. And you really, have to, you really have to push to get people out to see these films these days. So, in that sense, it, it's, uh, as a thriving industry, it's definitely one that's... Uh, Dead in the, dead in the yeah. door a little bit, really. I suppose also. So if it's not the money, that's the problem. It's the uh, it's the originality and the quality. Mm. Uh. That that's that's a weird one. Like when, we, when you think about when you're younger as well, you're not thinking about the the direct capitalist reasoning of like you know you paying to go to the cinema. You're going about thinking about popcorn, how much it's going to cost, how much a cinema ticket yeah. is going to cost. Yeah. And I think that really does then, kind you know, of. Uh, it, it does there's a, there's a cinema in Birmingham called the Electric, hmm. and it, you know the, the, the lobby is very much like something out of a David Lynch film, and then uh, <laughs> mm. you can you, rent, you can you can pay for a settee, your sofa, and then they, you can text the desk at the front, and they'll bring you a beer. Oh, wow. And obviously, they're instilling the, the beauty of the cinema experience. You know, it's not just some sort of conveyor belt machination of a chain. It's like mm. a, one of the oldest surviving independent cinemas. And We've got obviously. something similar to here in Mile End, the Genesis. Have you been? No, never no, been. No, no. Never been. That's where you know Dark Side Magazine run their Dark Fest there. Oh yeah, and they do the there. Yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful cinema, and it is the experience. It's the building. It's the fact that it's an independent cinema it makes all the difference. Exactly, because like back then when you used to get a program and whatnot, it's like going to the the opera or the theatre. Yeah. And if you look at, if you imagine going to the, see like two thousand and one when that first came out, that would have been like going to an opera or something. Mm. And uh, you know there was something a bit more majestic about it. And now it just seems I don't know. It's, uh, it's all a bit too clinical now. Well, I don't know so if you should, uh, guys agree. But oh, so if you look at the buildings. Yeah, the old cinema buildings, that the big grand theatre style things, that mm. take yeah, give away for multiplexes. It's a, a sad thing. It really is, you know. And there's one in Worcester just near me. That's that's obviously 
not a cinema anymore, but it's got all the old trappings on the outside with the, the big the big name of it spilling down in one big sign that takes the whole building. <laughs> it's just absolutely beautiful to look at, but unfortunately no longer a cinema, you know. So. See, I've always had a problem with independent cinemas because they always seem to have to toe the line between truly being independent but also then having to play every same independent film as all the other cinemas. Or at least I've kind of felt like that in my yeah. own personal city. And, and I've always heard of those sort of like fears like you guys have discussed. And it's a shame that didn't continue. And obviously it's, it's the capitalist reasoning and it's kind of eaten itself with everything that's happening now. I mean, the electric always makes makes a point. Well, when we're not in a pandemic, um, we have made a point of doing shock and gore seasons, where they'd invite, you know, casts and uh, crews of the cult films to come and kind of do Q and A's, and they they cherry pick amazingly, you know, individualist films. I mean, I went to see uh, Harmony Corinne's Trash Humpers there, which <laughs> really is a uh, a film that you should be watching on video more so because it's a found VHS tape of people just acting stupid in old people's masks but um, but at least the electric had the balls to show it you know yeah. I think that's the thing I think it's cool. <laughs> Tom I think that's a problem there because the choice is not there though. All the, if you look at the amount of films that actually make it to screen it's ridiculous mm. our choice yeah. is basically decided for us you don't really have a choice no, this is it, absolutely. So you've got to kind of travel a little bit further to find the one screen to that with showing that you know your the film that you want to see, but like of the first of two screenings in a whole week or something. So this really um, got to kind of work to find, support the cause, really. This actually nicely brings me into um, the other side of obviously film viewing, with um, watching your own stuff from home. Now, Vince was saying earlier about, like, you know, when you select that film and that kind of experience, it really does, I, yeah. I know it sounds obvious, but you are back into being in control. You're the one that's choosing whatever you can, you know, successfully convince the person that you're of the age to watch, but, you know, it's, it, it is a very different thing. And I feel like you can almost have that independent cinema feel by just strolling through the films. I remember I used to do it all the time with film friends just strolling through the local Ross Records or whatever kind of shop you've got and just seeing all those DVDs and be like, oh, that's only 50p, I'll buy like those, I'm going to watch them and then you may never watch them. But that in itself is, is an experience that is a part of like being a film fan, you know? Yeah, again, I mean, I think, I think that that comes from, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a certain time period, you're growing up with it. Mm. You know, I think... A lot of us, all speaking here, grew up in a, in a very specific time period where there was a transition from uh, cinema to uh, to VHS rentals, um, uh, and I mean that was key to us as a childhood. You know, when when you start discovering movies from uh, John Carpenter and Stuart Gordon and George Romero and Toby Hooper and Sam Raimi, all from the video store. That, that's that's yeah. a whole other conversation, mm. you know, like that Absolutely. is a whole, a whole other thing. Yeah. And when, when you go into those video stores and uh, the VHS boxes were, were so attractive, you know, yeah. like, even, you know, even uh, you, you think of the VHS covers for Maniac or Zombie or, or uh, Prom Night and, and the Howling, especially like the, I, love, I always love that cover. I always love Escape from New York. And, and you're like, you're drawn into this stuff, you know, a Dirty Harry and Magnum Force. And you're drawn into that as, as when you're young, you know, you're like, what the hell? Like, this is crazy. Like all of a sudden five movie posters becomes hundreds of, of movie posters in inside us a, a very even a very small video store and i you know i mean when back when when i first started renting movies um you know uh, my mom would have to rent them because i wanted the horror movies and we do a like a two horror movie uh uh birthday party or a horror movie plus the road warrior or something like that and <laughs> You know, you, you, your mom or your dad would always have to rent those for you yeah. because you weren't old enough to rent them. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and and they would always take, in, in Canada, or well, where I grew up anyway, the video stores around our place, which of which there were only two, and Blockbuster didn't even exist yet. Uh, uh, it was a happy time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes. I mean, you could actually reserve videos. You could reserve them. 
uh, you know, you call up, you say, okay, I want to reserve this video for Saturday night, blah, blah, blah. They're like, okay, and, uh, and they would hold it for you. Uh, uh, you could reserve it on a Wednesday for a Saturday. I remember one summer, uh, I was, uh, Jesus, how old was I? I must have been about 12. And this is when I really, really started to get into cinema. But there was one summer where, and this happens in Vancouver uh, every three or four, three, four, five years. Uh, there's a summer where it just rains all summer. There's no sun. It just rains. And um, this was one of those summers. And so all I did for a month was uh, I would walk down to the local video store, pick up two or three videos, walk back to my place, watch them. And then the next day or the day after that, uh, walk back, return them, and get two or three more. And I think that's when I really, really started getting into cinema was then. You know, and then I yeah, it sounds like bit, heaven. Yeah, you know, it was. It's, uh, t- it's totally a story I relate to more so than the the romanticism of going to the cinema. I'm all about the VHS boom, mm. uh, which I'm guessing we all are really. I mean, yeah. Yeah. you know, um, like you say, by the time I found like you know hit all the gold with the horrors and whatnot, I I started to look at world cinema, and obviously sometimes you get these crossover films where they'd have elements of horror, such as Zulawski's Possession, and you, you want to see it because it's got elements of horror in it, but then you watch it and it just totally blows your mind apart because you're not quite sure what it was you just saw, but it was a bit too clever for you maybe, <laughs> and, um, and then all of a sudden you're watching world cinema, you're watching Arto's films, and so horror, horror was that great gateway drug uh, on the, from the video shelf, and then obviously... Video shops never used to discriminate, you know, you could have yeah. um, so, uh, a really just low budget DIY film next to an yeah. Arte's film. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I want to yeah. emphasise what you just said, Tom. There was actually yeah. a genuine choice then, because you never knew what was going to turn up in your local video shop. There were yeah. loads of independent companies and they, could, they all had an outlet. Mm. They could get their films to your local shop and you had choice. Like yeah. you said, and you, no you didn't know what was going to be side to side. And, you know, they'd spend money on ridiculously, like, elaborate marketing for films that were made for a pittance, and you think, well, it's amazing that these films got such attention back then. Like, they, there was no discrimination between, you know, the studio system and the independence. It was just all went in the melting pot together, mm. and that was so freeing and so amazing to kind of see, because it just inspired you to think, well, we can get there, you know, we can do that ourselves. And people did, you know. I mean, um, you look at those uh, those American shot on video, like basically shot on VHS productions. Mm. Yeah, and like that, video, that uh, video violence of that time period. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, cannibal, yeah, the video, the video cannibal dead, campaigns. Uh, the Ripper, you know, like uh, like all of those like actual shot on video stuff. And there was hundreds, and even hundreds like, of know, them. Going back to the Deadly Spawn, you know, Deadly Spawn, it was all yeah. made by fans who had been watching these films, you know, and they just thought, well, we can do that. And they yeah. busted up doing it, but it gets out there and it's just, it's it's circulated far and wide, so. Yeah. It was just that, that sense of inclusion, I think, which came you know, with that. You know, there were that. even people, like like the producers for that Tom Sabine film, The Ripper, people like mm-hmm. that, that actually went out, bought a VHS video recording camera for like, you know, 2000 bucks back in that, that day and decided to make it their business uh, to, to provide video content for video stores, you know? Which is incredible. I mean, that's just Vince, like, you know... Vince, can I ask you a question? Yeah. In, uh, obviously, your side of the Atlantic, do you reckon there's more barriers now to filmmakers doing that? They, in, in terms Good of question. getting the stuff into the it, it, out into distribution, is it, you know? yes. Well, in terms of distribution, actually, I, I think I think that there's uh, that, that that that's a tough one. There's always going to be barriers um, for people doing that. As 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 much as as the, the democracy of direct video distribution opens up. Uh, there will always be capitalist barriers and corporate barriers, mm. uh, and it's not—it's really no longer um, 
the movie studios doing it. Uh, I mean, they, they do do it a little bit. You know, they're, they're going back to that. In North America, the movie studios are going back to that thing where they own their own cinemas, which became illegal in the 1960s. It, it, it was actually, it, it became illegal in the 1960s for a movie studio to own their own cinemas because of that break, in, because there's no break in chain for distribution. It's like, well, then, then you're dictating what, what movies people are seeing. But now... They're revisiting that, and, and I don't know if they've uh, if they have pulled that back, repealed it, or, or if they're in the talks of, uh, about in talks about doing that. But, got, but something is happening with that now. And nowadays, I actually think that might be a good thing because this might be the only way to keep cinemas around. So as time change changes, things change, and now for independent filmmakers. Even in light of this, and even in light of this happening, uh, yes, it's a necessary evil for studios maybe to own their own cinemas now just to keep them alive, to keep cinema alive, period, even though you might only be going to go and see Marvel movies. Um, yes. The, 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 the flip side of that is it's actually not the movie studios that are that are now blocking wider distribution for independence uh, it's, it's it becomes more corporate people because you now get yeah. this, uh, Netflix this support the drama space, they? yeah 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 there you, you got it you got it you know you know what's going on well, people people do yeah. know what's going on you know they, they know what's yeah. going on um, it's and that's unfortunate so so yeah I mean I mean it does it does become a smaller it, but what happens is I think then then these indif- independent things become niche you know like it, yeah. there are niche outlets for these types of films ultimately people do have choices but but the problem is is they're not aware they have a choice and that's really the yeah. key thing um, yeah. they have they, they do have choices to see these films but but how do you let them know that those choices are there yeah. it's like it's, yeah. I, I always equate distribution to having a, to, to hosting a party I've always said this throughout all my years I always I keep saying it to my wife it's like it doesn't matter if you're holding a party nobody's gonna come unless you send the invites mm-hmm. yeah and that's that yeah. that's what distribution is you've got to send the invites out you've got to let people know where these films are available you know that's the thing you know if you, if you absolutely invite people to where they're available then people will have will start to have more of a choice. I mean, only 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 just earlier I was talking about how Amazon hosts um, anybody's independent film, and obviously there have been cases where they're being get, taken down, down or yeah. whatnot. This is whether they're being streamed enough, or maybe there's the content's too uh, extreme for them. But the problem is, it's like even the films that I love from the eighties, if whether they're from Hong Kong or whether they're from the US. They're buried really deep into the, cap- the library that you, yeah. you've got no real way of finding out how they're there, really, if they exist. No. And it's only it's only through clicking on a couple of other films that you get these suggestions suddenly pop up. Because if you look at the main face of Amazon's advertising, they'll advertise the same 20 plus films and won't tell you the rest of what's there. So it's down to the individual, really, to the creator or the distributor to just send, say, well, this is where it is. But, um, yes. Yeah. It's just such a saturated market at the same time, but Amazon have obviously clocked onto that and know that they will let people just upload their their stuff. <laughs> but um, whether people will realise it's there or not is a different matter. The thing is, with Amazon, like, because I remember originally with Amazon, their first thing is they started the whole pilot season where they were trying to encourage any creatives to write a script and send it in. But all they were really interested was creating some attention towards the, you know, like the, the bigger indies to get involved with what Amazon were doing. And it seems like they did the same thing with the films, because I feel like it's not to do with the content, it's more to do with the fact that they want to give more attention towards their bigger productions, because they're not interested in helping creators. And it's, it's, it's an unfortunate no, no. kind of... It's that horrible capitalist side of it. Let's, let's go back to a nicer side, <laughs> and let's talk about collecting, because that's the other side. When it comes to physical okay. uh, films... There's that beautiful side where, as a collector, you get something a little bit extra and special to keep hold of why you love that film. And I know you're all collectors. And I know you, for example, Vince. <laughs> collections, you know, it's all part of it. And of course, seeing... It's a can of worms, that one is. <sighs> yeah, I mean, um, my, my wife uh, definitely wants to get rid of uh, all my Blu-rays. <laughs> 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 Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I am. I, I, but I, but I think that 
see, see, I think with people like us, I, I think that it comes down to, uh, I, I actually do believe it's, it's a mix of nostalgia with our own kind of self-appointed responsibility to archive these things. Because if we don't do yeah. it, we're going to do it. Mm. Yes, yes, I, I agree, wholeheartedly agree with that. And Vince, I know you're a filmmaker as well, so I'm not sure if, like me, you have to be, when I'm creating, whether I'm writing or editing, I have to be sat with my collection just looking at all those titles and just feeling like <laughs> oh, this yeah. is what I'm contributing to. We've yeah. all got our libraries of films. A absolutely. I use even just the visual aspect of the fact that the collection's there to inspire me. 100% I do. Absolutely that. I agree. Because I, I one day you see yours amongst them and then you're just, you're just so turned on by that and uh, <laughs> you just want to keep making more. <laughs> I, I well, think actually, also... I, I, use it, I use it in more of a different aspect in, in terms of, like I think, a, a little bit more direct inspiration. Like, I, I can look over at the collection and every time I look over, I, I, I'm remembering like, uh, like all these clever or brilliant or inspiring films and what absolutely like what it made me feel about them you know and then and then i can i can um channel that into whatever work it is i'm doing hmm. at that time and then you know you look at some titles and you just think about the miracle of them actually existing on your shelf because some oh, films, like, really? <laughs> you know <laughs> really you think like how on earth did this get a deal but because of this reason and how bold it is i love it you know and then it's just the fact that a lot of film directors don't even realise that their films end up on a shelf because they made these way before the VHS or DVD. So. Mm. <laughs> yep, exactly. I, I, I think I know the answer to this, but do you Go think on. it's horror fans that are keeping this alive? That need I think the most part, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I think without Absolutely, horror yeah. fans, physical media would have gone to the wall a long while ago. I'll, that's my personal opinion. I totally agree because horror horror is that gateway genre because mm. as a filmmaker and a film fan, horror is the natural place to start because every other genre fits into horror. And if you wanted to make your first film, you can make you can do a horror film with special effects. You can try out special effects. You can try out uh, atmosphere. You, you can even put drama, comedy. You can even put musical numbers in the film, and it'll still be mainly horror. You know, so it's just a great place to start for anybody, really. Do you Remember think also, film fans or filmmakers? As as we know, there is quite a tight and uh, loving horror community, generally in the UK. America is, you know, goes back and forth. But as a community, do you think we we help to to the, on the collection side in that respect? Because I completely agree with you, Singh. And I feel like you can definitely see that in the community. If it's not sharing it online or if it's not going to conventions, you you you're keeping those, like you said, Tom, archives going. Yeah, because, um, you know, um, sometimes uh, if a filmmaker's brought his own DVD, and cause obviously I've got a history of self-distribution as well as mm. my, my friends Baz and Steve, and, and and then people want that collectability in something, so you'll bring it to the table, it's got a free set of postcards with it. These people just want to buy copies because they want to be able to have something rare or something, you know, a little diamond in their little collection that their friends might not have. I know it's not yeah. a competition, but it's something that they can explore together then, you know, and then think, well, they're supporting the cause, and then they've also got a collectible in the process. This is a collectability of things. Yeah. And Tom, just adding on to that, horror is always, never for me, it's never been about watching films of my own. If yeah. I've got a no, DVD exactly. or a VHS, you get your mates around and you chuck it on. I mean, a, a horror festival is just an enlarged version of that yeah. where you're watching yeah, films absolutely that. Yeah, that, I mean that, that, that's this lockdown business has kind of this lockdown business has, get, like, has uh, got me staying home a lot more which has therefore given me more wages to spend on films <laughs> and uh, the blu-rays <laughs> so I've amassed yeah. like a pile of films that I'm refusing to watch until I can get together with friends and we can watch those together exactly exactly my point I've got, I've bought a few that I've got a few friends who'd love to watch it, and we kind of just say, "Look, I've got this. I'm going to hold off till you're allowed brown, and we'll watch it together." <laughs> yeah, it was about that shared experience. Absolutely, yeah. And you know, like going back to what I was saying about people 
want to per- want the perfect film experience these days, and sometimes that involves just not going to the cinema because you know if you want to drink your booze or smoke your dope, you can do it in the confines of your own home watching your favourite films together. <laughs> mm. <laughs> You know what, Sam, if you don't mind me adding to, to this part of the conversation, um, I, I actually have to circle around and say that, uh, that, that I'd like to represent uh, uh, a, a portion of the, of, the, of the horror fan community that, uh, that, that maybe uh, discovered these things on their own. And, and, and how I started discovering things like they're just sort of sitting in solitary, if you will, uh, uh, it was actually because I worked at a video store. I used to I used to huh. work at a Blockbuster uh, that was a, well, in a city outside of my city, and I would do the night shift. So we closed at midnight, and uh, and of course Blockbuster didn't have the the amount of titles that this video store called Tom's Video did, which was about maybe six blocks from where I lived at the time. And so I would I would finish my shift at midnight. I would go over to closer to where I live, go up to Tom's video where I could get things like the Toxic Avenger and uh, 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 Frank Henenlotter's Brain Damage and Basket Case, wow. Basket Case too, like those things. And I would bring them home and I'd have to watch them by myself because by the time I got home, it was 1, 1.30 in the morning. And I had to I had to experience these by myself. And, uh, and, and I took some great joy in that but but the funny thing is is even to this day like yes i mean i i agree with uh uh you know and now with covid we, we've got more time and maybe a little bit more expenses to spend on blu-rays and things like that but i still enjoy just i i actually enjoy experiencing these quirky strange films on my own like i like i actually take joy in that like and so for me it, it absolutely it was it was it, um, yes, for, yes. For, for, for my side it was never about uh sharing it even though i see i, I mean absolutely most people's experience are that but i just don't i i don't want to i want to make sure i validate the fact that you can enjoy these on your own and, and mm. like and take these in no, and, 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 and have your own internal uh, thoughts and opinions and joy uh, with, with uh, these really you know niche films and, and cult films and indie films you know and I mean, uh, your journey your journey yeah. into cinema is always your personal isn't it it's always your yeah own. yeah it, and, is. it is but then you get so passionate about it you ultimately want yeah. to connect with other people to share that yeah. that magic that you found and, uh, oh you know what sometimes these people aren't willing to watch these kind of films but then by the end of it they just they can't quite believe what they've seen <laughs> totally Totally. Yes, a hundred percent. I can I can imagine all of us being that kid running around with bad taste, having watched it by themselves, saying, "Yeah, you need to watch this. It's brilliant." <laughs> yeah, exactly that. You know, you, you, before you know, the whole the whole class of mates have just had to sit through bad taste, and it's a film that they didn't know they actually needed in their lives. <laughs> oh my god! You know, a hundred percent. Like uh, like I remember being in high school, and like I was in this art class, and I was I was overhearing a conversation about these two guys, and the funny thing was, was they took the art class. Because yeah, they thought it was an easy thing, they they were a couple of uh, jocks in high school, uh, but they they had gone out and gotten stoned and rented um, Anguish, the uh, the Spanish oh, film, wow. yeah, and yeah, that's people, awesome. like, it, like it melted their minds. And I'm listening to this conversation, and what do you think I did that night? Like right after right after school, let out, I went down to the video store, I rented Anguish. I'm like, I gotta <laughs> see this, right? Like <laughs> I mean, I'm hearing these guys talk about it. I gotta see what the fuck they're talking about, right? That's a great little film, that is. It's a great little it film. Is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, um, I come to you come to realize I can go. I just want to make a point going back to when you could go down these video shop. You you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to specify whether the film you're watching was a a, Euro, a European film, like a French film or an Italian mm. film. It was just clearly a non-biased look at the cover, and then that's it. Boom. Yeah. And then obviously word of mouth, but then. You'd see things like, I mean, back in the day, this is how, how kind of unbiased things were at the time, is that Warner Brothers actually put out Toxic Avenger 2 at one point Yeah. on video, which yeah, is yeah. absolutely crazy when you think about that now. <laughs> yeah, but, but actually, absolutely that's, a really, crazy. That, that's a really great point, and until you said that, I didn't realise uh, myself that, that that's actually how we run our distribution company, because... Uh, you know, always we're, we're getting asked by buyers, well, do you only do American films or North American films? Yeah, and no, we, we, we acquire 
comes from all over the world, and and I don't think yeah. anything about it. Like it, it makes no difference to me, and and it's unfortunate that nowadays that that is the one thing we're missing that mm. we had in those VHS days. It's like you said, that complete unbiased thing. Yeah. It didn't matter if it was a dubbed Italian movie or a Spanish movie uh, or a British film. I mean, it didn't matter. They all looked the same. Right? They, like just, they, they just helped. Yeah. Just the yeah. actual language of cinema. Yeah. And that's you know, right. That's exactly right. You start to pick right. up the patterns. You start yeah. to pick up the patterns. You start noticing the same names, the same yeah. styles, the same film stocks. That's and right. And before you know it, you've kind of differentiated what these films are, and you're starting to cotton on to what's going on behind the scenes and yep. how these films are kind of circulated and how they're retitled. I mean, we used to get the same film uh, with a different title. We just wouldn't realise it because it'd have a different cover, sometimes a better cover, and then we'd realise we've already got the damn film. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and they're usually yeah. they're usually films involving ninjas. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Tom, just very quickly, you know when we talk about collecting physical media. I'm yeah. sure you've still got some VHS tapes that you can't get on any other format. Mm. Absolutely. And that's the only format yeah. you still have. That's another thing for holding on and collecting because you don't know if you're going to see that film ever again on another format. Yeah, well, being said, we are the people that have to, you know, we're, we're, we are uh, documenting and, and uh, cataloguing these films in our own little ways just so they don't get forgotten or, you know, or yeah, bent, by tweet you know, about so. it. Yeah. That's, that's how we do it now. We tweet Somebody's about them. <laughs> and the, I, well, the final point I wanted to kind of go on is, I suppose, the complete opposite of physical collection. It is the more digital, you know, video on demand. And kind of like where you guys feel about it, because I'm personally, I, I can sit and watch Netflix all day, and it could be film, it could be TV. I still feel like I'm serving the watching the medium to some degree. But also as an independent filmmaker, like, VOD is so important to getting to a much wider market that potentially wouldn't physically buy your film because they'll look at it and go, hmm, maybe I'll go with one with Tom Cruise instead. And I, I get, it's I like that two got, swords. I think that's got plenty of pros and cons. Yeah, it has, it has. I think one of the biggest cons is, um, is if I say, um, my film Bell and the Witch Home did really well on DVD because there was a... A, a cover, which meant there was also a personality mm. introducing you to this film, and then there was like a personable touch. Uh, but then when I stuck it on Amazon, people wouldn't have taken to it as, as well because they were just faced with this really low budget looking film, and then therefore they were invited not to kind of treat it uh, for what it is. They'd just probably just go yeah. off it and wouldn't watch the whole thing. So it's kind of giving it this faceless kind of presence in a stream of films. Yeah. And Without that personable touch, that hard copy touch, where you're selling, like, because I was selling DVDs with a set of free postcards with stills in the film, and then there was a collectability to it, and also a personality, and they were invited to enjoy this film. Whereas if they stumbled upon it on Amazon, they might have hated it because they wouldn't have seen any context with it. Do you know what I mean? On a, on a point with that, I just want to say one thing before I jump to the other guys. Um, have you have you have you guys worked with independent VOD sites? Because it's kind of weird with independent VOD sites. In my mind, because I completely agree, Amazon is just like a graveyard throwing yourself out there for no one to really appreciate. But when you look at, like, I work with some companies called Versus Media Stream now, because they're, cause they're small and developing and building at the same time as you as an artist. You're, I don't know, it's like you don't feel like you're being dumped into somewhere. You feel like you're joining, not a family, but a collection uh -huh. of, um, a collection of other creators, I guess. That's cool. And I, I, I don't know if I I'm... think people were cotton on to... Film fans would cotton on to that then, and then they would want to see... If they like the one, they want to see the other, and then you they want to see so, the other. Yeah. And it, it all, it's all under an umbrella then, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the weird thing is, from, from myself, is that just as an audience member, have you guys all seen uh, Ocean's Eleven? The, the remake with uh, George Clooney? Yes. 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 Okay. yes. So, so the, there's a scene in the middle of it which I equate to me watching Netflix. And it's a scene with Don Cheadle sitting in a hotel room on tele. He's watching the television and he's watching the destruction, like the blowing up of an old uh, Las Vegas hotel and casino when it's actually happening right behind him, behind his hotel windows. But he's watching on the, on the telly. <laughs> and, and that's how I equate myself as an audience 
uh, remember watching Netflix because I will often yeah. watch Netflix yes. because it's more convenient when I have the Blu-ray right behind me of the same <laughs> yes. <fucking> film. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that. So, so we're so uh, conflicted now as film fans. Yeah, we're it's so a, conflicted it, because it, we it, want to support that cause. Yeah. But we've got the remote to Netflix right in front of us. We're going to see what's on there first. <laughs> yeah, yes, it's, it, it, it's true. But 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 at, at the same time, I mean, uh, it, when, when it comes down to brass tacks, that uh, some some films are available on Blu-ray and DVD, you won't be able to get on Netflix. Uh, Net, yeah. Netflix, you, you can't always go to Netflix and guarantee that that film you liked is going to be there in four months. Mm. It won't be there. Yeah. Sometimes, so not all the time, but sometimes, and that's the thing. When you Absolutely. buy it, when you buy a piece of physical home media, it's always there. Yeah. It's there. You, you, it's yours. You can you can do with it what you will, uh, and uh, you know you, you can keep it for ten years and watch it ten years down the road. Um, you can watch it when you decide that uh, that that uh, uh, you you, uh, you don't make enough money to be able to afford. Uh, to contribute to five or six or seven or eight or nine or ten completely different uh, subscription VOD services. Yeah. You know, uh, you know what? I, I want to cut these all off right now. I, 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 I can't afford, you know, 400 pounds a month just on VOD services or 200 or 100 or 500 for whatever you're paying. I'm going to save my money for this year, but I've got, a, I've, I've got you know, I've got all my archive Blu-rays and DVDs and VHS uh, Absolutely. Me on, my, on my bookshelves, I, I'm fine with that. I'm going to revisit some of these things. Mm. You know? You'd rather hold, yeah. hold something tangible and have the luxury to peruse and watch it again and again and again and have a relationship. I mean, it's the yeah. same with music. I mean, I'm such a big music fan, but I haven't got a record collection because <laughs> I always spend all my money on films. Um, but it means most new music that I get into, I've forgotten about by the end of the week because I haven't got anything tangible there to remind me and to kind of bond with. Yeah, that's a good point. A hundred percent. You need something to hold, artwork to appreciate. Mm. Yeah. It's a whole package, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, it, absolutely. It's interesting, isn't it? Because if we take those three different mediums that we've discussed throughout this whole chat, we've discussed cinema and we've discussed physical media and we've discussed VOD, <laughs> but we all still sit happily in the middle when it comes to loving film as opposed to just watching a film? Well, I, I don't yeah. know. I, I mean, I, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disagree very slightly um, with, with sitting in the middle because uh, because in actual fact, for myself, and, and I'm only speaking for myself, but I feel that it's uh, it, it can be attributed to uh, people of my age, people from my generation, but I can take or leave the subscription platforms. Um, if, if we can afford them and we have them, then great. But and, and if not, I, I really don't care. I honestly, I don't, I don't care. You know, uh, I've got my Blu-rays. Uh, you know, I and 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 COVID nineteen aside, uh, generally speaking, you know, when, when times are quote unquote normal, uh, we have the cinema. Mm. And we can go to the cinema and we can go to uh, film festivals or even now what I'm discovering is, uh, you know, from being lucky enough to be in a business where I'm involved with film markets is that we, as, as any audience, not just distributors, but any audience member has access to online film festivals now. Yeah, that's true. Watch my eyes as well. And, and, and so, so, you know, do we need to be paying for these streaming services? Well, they, they need to, they need to uh, really continue to up their game in order to get us to, uh, to, to get our loyalty, to be honest with you. Yeah. You know, we're, we're not just going to automatically be loyalty and just give you 10 or 13 or 15 or 20 or 5 bucks a month uh, for just because... Just uh, just because you say so, just because you say you're great. Um, I mean, you got to up that game because now we do have online film festivals that we can we can spend our time looking into. And, and again, it goes back to that choice thing. But where, where, where do we find these things? Where are those choices? And what's actually kind of really cool is because of COVID-19, a lot of theaters and distributors have gotten into a... Uh, sort of an online streaming collaboration, which now includes film festivals. So, in actual fact, going back to the cinema 
in the world of COVID-19 lockdowns and new uh, digital streaming platforms, you are starting to get that choice back in the quote-unquote cinemas. I mean, yes, it, it, it is still the cinema company. It just might not be the actual theater with your butt in the seat and, and a bucket of popcorn. But, but actually, that choice is coming back because of this, because now you've got companies like Kino Lorber that are distributing their films uh, with, with agreements through, through various cinemas. Uh, you know, Mongol, uh, M- Mongrel Media, uh, Mongolia, like all, all of these um, smaller distribution companies where you get to see these independent, you get to see these art house, you get to see these genre films. Uh, now, they are available through the cinema platforms. So you have a favorite cinema in in your area, like we do in Vancouver. You go online and see what the cinema is streaming on on their platform uh, via the distributor, and all of a sudden uh, you get you start getting your choice back that that was taken away from us. So yeah. that's really interesting. Vince, you managed to bring it. You managed to bring it full circle. <laughs> <laughs> As intended. <laughs> it kind of feels like a perfect way to sum up, really, doesn't it? I mean, I genuinely do want to um, uh, support a lot more of these online uh, festivals. And, but again, um, whether I just kind of shut off the things that just, I don't respond to. And one of these things is to sit, uh, when you imagine in your head sitting amongst a crowd at a festival because there's really nothing to match that experience no, that's true. but at the same time I do recognise the necessity to keep these names and to keep these brands going and these festivals going by just adapting because music festivals are doing it also which is the most bizarre thing in the world mm. and um, but yeah. it's a way to keep it going uh, and to defy uh, again to, in defiance against the odds you know what's going on and you kind of respect that but at the same time it's just totally not my bag. <laughs> well, 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 actually, let, let me say something that, that may change your mind. And I'm, I want to spin, spin it for you in a different way. And sure. I want you to think about that. Why why is it it gets you back up with, with these things? With the, with, and, and I'll agree that, you know, uh, that, that there's a, a possibly an inundation of these things now, now that everything can be online. But... I would argue that the reason we need to back up against it is because we've already been, uh, in a in a very capitalistic way, brainwashed by the corporations like Netflix and Amazon. Sure. Where it needs to be these platforms, or or you really should be. You're wasting your time. Like, what are you yeah. doing? Blah blah blah. You know, it, 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 and and it's weird. It's kind of an insidious. Um, aspect of these corporate platforms advertising that has left us brainwashed in, in mm. that manner. You know, I, re- I really think we have to take a little bit more of a closer look at that, even even a microscopic look at that and say, is, is that actually what's happening in terms of like Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and Roku getting their brands out there? And like, if you're not, if, if, and Disney, you know, and, and if you're not uh, subscribing to one of the big five, then uh, you're wasting your time. It's just going to be full of shit. There's going to be movies you don't like, and, yeah. and 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 that affects the way we look at these online film film festivals now too, and, yeah. and even even it's music, good. even music too. Because I mean, realistically, I I don't know if you guys know or remember, but uh, Axl Rose tried to sue uh, uh, Live Nation because Live Nation bought his uh, eight, uh, his his agent his agent's company. And he's like, well, how is my agent supposed to effectively negotiate a contract with you if you own him? Yeah. And that and that's what we're looking at, even with music. So 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 in actual fact, like these online music film fest, uh, music film fest, which is correct, these online music festivals um, are actually in the face of uh, of corporations like Live Nation. Mm. You know, it's 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 not it it, it becomes less about. The, the, the corporate representation of quote unquote festivals, which we all know a lot of these big festivals are now. You know, they're all corporate, and, and um, yeah, that, that's a whole other conversation. But <laughs> the thing is, is, is we have to unlearn that. We have to learn 
relearn to to not get our backs up against when we're presented with choice. <laughs> we have a choice. We we can choose to to spend maybe two or five bucks on an independent film festival where you can see ten or fifteen or twenty films you may never get to see see again or you know experience again. Or uh, do you want to spend your twenty bucks on two or two months of uh, Netflix subscription? Where yeah, you're spending absolutely. most of your time let's, let's on, the re- on, on the remote control, flipping through movies you've already mm-hmm. seen. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I mean, then, then, yeah, I mean, everybody wants choice, and when we're given the choice, and to enforce don't, what you're yeah. saying, um, to enforce what you're saying, people are creating uh, watch parties. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you've ever partaken in any, but you do feel that you do still start to feel that sense of unity that you Definitely. feel watching yeah. a film at a festival with friends because people are still able totally. to communicate whilst they're watching yes. that film and I think this is a great way of adapting to the situation yeah I agree I agree I, I, I think it's good it's not like you know I was just I was just speaking with somebody I mean we, we took part in the virtual can at film fest and it's not the same of course I would prefer to be there yeah. obviously mm-hmm. but it wasn't terrible you know the virtual aspect no. of it, it wasn't terrible so i was very curious to know how that would work yeah it, it well i mean business wise it was fine um but again human beings are human beings and we're going to need that contact with other people and, sure. and 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 whether you go to the cinema by yourself or with other people you're inevitably contacting other people and the same thing with the video store it doesn't ultimately whatever happens with my experience with any individual film, even though it was on my own, and that's what I was trying to validate, in, in, you know, 30, 30 minutes ago. Um, the fact of the matter is, I still went to a video store. I still spoke with a clerk. I still spoke with people that were in the video store and bonded over what, whatever it, it was we were doing at that time. Maybe that was only five or ten minutes, and then I took that movie home and experienced that individual film for myself. But there was still a social aspect for it. With, with that yeah. came along with it, no matter what, and and I think that that ultimately really is the thing. We can't just completely separate ourselves from this thing forever, uh, because we're human beings, and human beings are not meant to do that. Period. And then and you start to think, you start to think of the purposes of uh, your product then as well, because if we're if film festivals weren't to ever happen again, maybe or. You know, uh, do you feel still inc- as inclined to, to create the product, to be able to discuss it in person with people, to to appreciate the work with people? You know, it might see a total slowdown of production in this in that instance. You know, I never thought of that, but that yeah, that's actually it's how you about. kind of it's how you correlate uh, your relationship with the cinema, obviously, and mm. how it's. Uh, uh, yeah. I, mean, I I see it as my way of communicating with the wider world, you know, to share and to... Uh, Tom, you know, Tom, why are you there? Yeah. Tom, obviously I was lucky enough to watch, was it Better and the Witch Elm at Horror on Sea? Yeah. Now, obviously obviously you were there, you saw the reaction from genuine fans. Like, like, mm-hmm. Do you think that spurred you on or do you, do you think... Absolutely, you yeah, because gone? you know... Yeah. Do you want to get back there next year? <laughs> do you want to get there with another yes. film under your arm? And do you want to just keep connecting with your kind of people? You know, and it's not very often that we're sat with our kind, you know, surrounded by our kind, where we can just talk non-stop <laughs> about yeah. what we learn. Sam, sorry. Sam, do you want to pitch in there as well? Because obviously we've, I've seen your work at Horror on Sea. And do you feel the same? No, it's Tom, or is it just... completely. I mean, like... I, I feel it is one of those unique experiences completely as people infused and they're talking about their work, you're talking about your work and you're just in the enjoyment of talking about creativity. And I feel like the watch parties do have an element to that but it's more of an immediate during that film. There isn't that afterwards. There isn't, there's you exploring if you want to continue to talk about it of course but you're still in the comfort of your own home. And that festival experience, especially if you have to travel away from where you live so for like Tom, it's from, you know, halfway the Midlands sort of area. For me, it's right down south in the UK. To have to go to Essex, it's a whole journey and it's a whole experience within itself. And I'd be incredibly miserable and sad if those experiences weren't there. But I also know that as a filmmaker, what I want to do is get my work out there in any medium possible. And if I can't hit certain mediums because the world can't do it right now, 
you look for a different platform. That's kind of where my head's at, as a filmmaker at least. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I was hoping to say that. <laughs> some of the, like, you know, I, I was just going to say some profound stuff at, uh, <laughs> nearing the end of this. Uh, absolutely, um, you know, it, there, there was like, there were some good points brought up that, that I didn't think of. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, absolutely. I, I, I do think, and I always thought uh, cinema was a social art, but in a different way, in a different mm-hmm. manner. I always thought of it more as a social art in terms of the artist uh, bringing ideas and opinions and representations uh, to wider audiences, right? And and that's the thing. Yeah. But, but the valid thing here is, is, well, how do you know what's working or not working with your own art if you can't get yeah. that feedback from it? Yeah. And you get that sure, feedback yeah. from, uh, from, from festival curation, you get that feedback from audiences attending your film while you're there in the audience while you're there in the audience you know or uh, uh for, from critics and and i think that uh critics are less interested in reviewing films right now because of covid because there's not there's no films in the cinema the uh the film festivals are online uh you know i mean i'm seeing a lot a lot less media about, about film festival films now than yeah. I have in the previous years. Mm-hmm. I think it's because the film festivals are online and kind of viewed as like not not as much as a, um, a prestigious uh, presentation of these films, you know? Which yeah. is shitty. Yeah, because is. Uh, because you, you, you can't you can't factor in a prestige element when everybody's in the same boat. Mm-hmm. Right? Sorry, Vince. Vince, I just want to interrupt very really, 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 really quickly. Yeah. You know, I just talked about these guys as artists getting their art facing to an audience and being encouraged. But also, yourself with Dark Side releasing, do you yourself see yourself as a curator where you've actually got the museum where the art comes to and you decide whether or not if a piece of art fits with what else you have? Do you 100%. think like that or is it purely yes. commercial? Nope, that's 100% uh, curating and contextualization. 100%. Yeah. And it, it shows, it shows, Vince, from uh, your output and mm. what you represent. And I personally just want to thank you for taking a chance on my film. <laughs> <laughs> well, we thought your film was amazing, so. Uh, I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is, is, is from from our point of view, we don't look at it as quote unquote, quoting unquote, you uh, taking a chance. Um, you know, we we always look at things. Do we like the first of all? Do we like the film? Second of all, yeah. how, how, how does this fit in with, with what we're, I guess you could say programming, but that's not the correct word, but, but yeah, what we're curating with everything, uh, how's this going to fit in? And then from there, we then take it to the next stage of, okay, so once we understand the curation uh, and the contextualization of a film, then we can market it because uh, ultimately what it, what, to, 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 to boil it down to, to a one sentence thing, we market what we believe in. Period. That's it. You know, if if we if we believe in your film, we love your film, we will find a, a contextualization for it. You know, we. Really and I think will. you are like the five percent out of a ninety-five percent kind of uh, cut of bad apples in terms of misrepresentation, because every every one of your releases retains the film's identity and dignity and and not there's barely any di- other distributors out there doing that you know no right and that's but, why but, i think but, he's doing so well he's gonna thrive yeah. because of that <laughs> and that honesty, honesty. I, I have to tell you guys thank you guys so much for the kind words but 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 i will say that that um, you, you, realistically, uh, other distribution companies can do very well with other people's films. It's just a different way of looking at them. They they, they do have, I, I mean, I agree, yes, 90, 95% of them are looking at it in a business way, but it depends on what the, the uh, creator of the, of, of the film wants. Do they, do they, do they want the film? Just if they, if they don't care about it, and just it just as long as it gets sold and is making money, uh, you know the, the the other 
distribution companies um, excel, excel at that as well. You know, it's just it's just a different way of bringing films to audiences, and we always believed in, in a more uh, curative type a- atmosphere when it, when it came to our films. Whereas other distribution companies believe that, well, if you if you mass uh, you know, if, if you put a bunch of product together and sell that, that'll make money, and and it does. Mm. Uh, so, so other other distributors, absolutely, they do make their 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 uh, producers money. It's not and it's, it's not anything to do that. It's just a completely different way about uh, in, in terms of how you go about it. And uh, and I think and, there's no and, need and, to get your back up on it. You know, I don't oh, think there's oh, any no, need no, for no, a film. No. Oh no no no! No, no I, I mean a film. No, I mean a filmmaker. No, I'm talking as a figurative, like as a filmmaker, to get their back up on it because oh, yeah. um, if if we remember uh, going back to our video store days, uh, part of the beauty of getting those video covers was yeah. that they were totally um, misrepresentative of the films that we'd end up seeing, <laughs> and that became and that became part of the excitement of being kind of blagged yeah. in a way. Oh my God! Totally. No, no, totally. How many times no, no, have you guys no, no, been no. duped oh, oh, by oh, a false cover? So many. Absolutely. Oh, or on, on, on the opposite. How, how about the opposite? How, how about how about a cover that looked completely like generic, or just like kind of put towards the masses, and you get it? And it's a super special and fantastic film, right? Like that's, yeah, yeah. That's the thing, right? Like that's really that's the thing. The way. And, 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 and and I think I think all all I was trying to say is that. Is that uh, other distribution companies just, just, just they just do things a different way? It's not that it's a bad way or, or, or it's a negative way. It's just a different way. They do things a different way than we do things, and 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 I think it really becomes up to uh, the producer and the filmmaker to decide uh, kind kind of what they want for their film. You know, do do they want more uh, boutique type? Exposure for their film that we provide, or do they just? Want I think that's a perfect to, way of putting it. Yeah, Definitely. yeah. You know, that's and, and, and that, that, you've got that, to ask that, yourself. That, that's all. That's all I meant. Because, because I mean, I don't want to come on this podcast and say that oh, we're a great distribution company, other people are not. That that's not true. That's not true. You know, uh, it's just everybody wants distribution companies in a different manner and and based on uh, experiences and successes that that they've had. You know, and that's the thing. And, well, I think and that's, that's a really cool way of looking at it. Yeah. You know, I mean, but, but really I cool think way. it's true. I think it's true. You know, and and so so it becomes up to the producer to think about well, well, what do they want for their film? Really, you know, did they make it on a lark and yeah, they don't give a shit? They just right. want to put it out there, or or did they make a film because they wanted to tell a story and they believed in their film and they and they'd like somebody to uh, support that uh, on a, on a little bit more of an individual basis? You know. That's all. I mean, my friend, uh, my friend Baz, he's in the same town making his own movies, and he turned down um, a contract from Troma because he knew that he could, he could sell his own product and make money from it. Whereas if he gave it to Troma, he'd be <clears throat> obviously getting a what much wider exposure, but he wouldn't be getting a penny. So yeah. he just decided, thing. well, it doesn't really matter to him the, the exposure. He'd, mo- he'd rather make his budget back so he can fund his next film. You know? Yeah, hundred percent. And again, like you said. Vince, it's all down to what you want from your film, and how you want it to perform. You know? Yeah, yeah, and, and I think it's a, I think it's a mistake for uh, producers to jump on the very first uh, distribution company that shows them interest. You know, I mean, I, th- I think they really have to think about. People have to think about what's going to be best for their film. Uh, what do they want? What really do they want out of their uh, out of their distribution contract? And, and ultimately, it's going to be a collaboration, no matter if yeah. the other side of them. Uh, agreed to use that word. Uh, that really is what it is, and and that's why we always take the stance to, uh, you know, what we we always talk to people beforehand because we want to get a sense of what they want from their film. And if I'm gonna if I'm gonna turn down a film, I'm gonna turn turn it down uh, verbally to your face because mm-hmm. because because it's gonna be something that that maybe you want that we can't deliver. And it's gonna it's gonna end up that that sort of situation, you know. And, and I think that's really important to get that contact in there so that you understand. And and I, I always like you know even, even if it never even if things don't work out between us and the producer, where they want different things than than we can do, or they want they want a different journey for their film, then I always leave that door open. I said, well, you know, if, if you change your mind on the road or if it doesn't work out, we're always here. It's no problem. But you know, I'm not going to change the way I 
look at films and the way I appreciate films and the way I would like to contextualize and curate films uh, to bend to somebody else. And I don't expect a producer to bend to what, what how, how we perform, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, but I think, I think I it's think really that, nice, really, really cool way of looking at it. It's really like transparency to it. And again, what appealed to me, again, is the fact that you let the films carry their own identity and like you say that's a sense of curation you are letting the film shine for what it is and I mean a lot of the films uh, you've got a great diversity of films so it's a very exciting little kind of melting pot you got yourself oh man you know I, I, I'm super excited about our, our company like I, I do really love what we're doing and I actually do think I mean I, I don't know if anybody knows but we're, but we're, we're quite a young company we only started in uh, at the AFM, uh, which was November in 2017. Mm. So we're not even three years old yet. This well, no. yeah, and uh, and you know I'm really proud of what we've done. Really proud. I love the films we take on. Obviously, you know I love I love the films we have. Um, I love the films that we're distributing for our producers, and I love working with our producers. And and I and I love the journey that the company is taking actually with this. And, and ultimately, I love the fact that we're able to provide not just one, but various and, and different platforms for our producers' films, you know? Uh, a case in point would be, would be uh, Millennial Killer, which actually just came out in the UK on Blu-ray uh, a week ago. Hmm. And I have to be honest with you, I didn't even realize it had been out there until Martin... <laughs> He asked me, I was like, is this legit? I was like, oh my God, because that, that, like, actually that was fast. We only delivered it to our whole city like a month ago. And uh, I was like, oh my God, I, that's, that was crazy fast. Uh, so yeah, some, sometimes, you know, we, we do these things and uh, uh, as a distribution company, I'll admit, uh, so, sometimes they, they get out there a little bit before we're, we're even aware it got out there. But I mean, we, we're, we're busy plugging plugging things into our wholesalers and our VOD platforms and things like that. I, and it's it's actually, I gotta tell you, I mean, it, it, it is it, it, it is a fantastic job to have. It's fantastic to be able to um, get producers, independent producers films out there, or even uh, not, not independent producers, like maybe, maybe even some, you know, like low budget uh, um, studio films that they had had some trouble with in the past, you know, Get them, re refresh them. You know, get some, get them some new platforms as well. I think because uh, you're a filmmaker, did, did it, was it born out of the, the um, were you disillusioned by how your films were treated by others, or was it just clearly a, ne a logical next step for you? No, it was uh, it, it was it was definitely defined by how uh, we had been treated by a distribution later in our production career. Um, so I just want to be clear about this because. Um, because we had a couple of films with the Asylum and, at the beginning of our career, and they treated us very, very well. I just want to be clear about that, because it was it was nothing to do with the Asylum. It was a bit later on when uh, the Asylum uh, actually then started focusing on only on in-house production, so they weren't acquiring other people's films um, after a certain point in time. And uh, we we really were dissatisfied with other distribution companies that that followed them. And uh, in fact, we, we liked the asylum so much. I still I still in, in contact with them to this day. And uh, but but we actually based our <coughs> pardon, we we actually based our distribution contract on the contract that the asylum gave us. Because it was it was so good and it was very beneficial to us and uh, for us they were a great great company to work with and uh, and and always uh, the the asylum will always be a huge inspiration to me so one of the things basically what it was was after we were not able to place our films with the asylum for global distribution then we had had trouble with other distribution companies. We became disillusioned. We tried. We also tried self distribution, but this was back in 2008, 2009, and our, our um, uh, 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 what, what, what we could do with it was so limited in terms of what you can do with it now. Uh, like so very limited, and so we we had a bad time with self distribution. 
And all we really wanted was to like do, do something uh, in, in terms of like what, what the asylum had offered us at the beginning uh, with those types of contracts. And so we just thought, well, then we're going to have to do that. And we're going to have to do that with our own films. And if we're going to do that with our own films, we're going to need we're going to have to do that with some other people's films too. And that's that's how we started. And um, did you see it as a kind of um, any way of sacrifice on your own filmmaking? Because I imagine it's quite a big chunk of your time taken out to deal with other people's films uh, in 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 place of developing your own would you say that's true or would you say I, I obviously yeah. you still love it I do I do I do love it but but I love it because of uh, filmmakers like you guys that, that bring your energy into it uh, otherwise I wouldn't mm -hmm. be able to do it if it weren't for you guys I wouldn't be able to do it your energy doing it because actually your energy is replacing what my loss was which is uh, yeah, that's cool. I, 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 I'm I'm unable to uh, produce our own films now. It is a full. It's more than a full time job, obviously. You know, I mean, we, we they, you have no idea. Like like even the the other distribution companies that we work with in, in tandem, they're also working. They're working through the weekends. You know, I tried to be, uh, I tried to have manners and, and, and say, well, you know what, we'll pick this up on Monday and blah blah blah. But that's not that's not how this world works. No. I mean, even in distribution, we're working through the weekends. We're sending emails at fucking midnight a lot of the time uh, <laughs> well. to, to, to each other, and and uh, so so no, there there's no time to produce films. But but I don't feel I don't feel a lack of satisfaction because that satisfaction gets filled uh, with you guys and your energy behind your films, and that we know that we're part of getting your films out there with all that energy behind you guys have had, have the energy your films completely exude all that energy which is amazing and i think that's what really is attractive about your films to to audiences and and so so we're completely we, we get satisfaction about distributing your films so so and the, the feeling is mutual you know i mean because you're you're providing a great service for us and that it makes us put our trust into someone who's been there themselves yeah, it's not just a faceless kind of body where that's just thinking about the the dollar sign you know it's yeah. somebody who's been there and it's born out of their own frustration but also based on the models that they loved and felt worked fairly in the in the game and that's 100%. what you're trying to demonstrate it yeah yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. You know, and and again, like you said, like and like I mentioned before, that's why we went back to and we based our contract off of the contract we had with the asylum because we we're like, well, that was fair, and we got paid, so that's the that's the one we're going to use because you know, because we want people to get paid, you know, like that's the thing, and 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 you know, I mean, I think that. <sighs> I don't know. I, I, I still go back to that thing where uh, that's how we operate. That's not how other dis distribution companies operate, but it's not to a detriment of anybody. It's just you have a choice when it comes to distribution. You know, you can choose to, yeah. do, to, to, to do what you will. I mean, I had, um, I had a producer uh, just call me yesterday, and they were signing between us and you know, like let's just say you know, distribution X company uh, went with the model of selling things more on a catalog platform. Like, no, I'll give you 20 films and blah blah blah. Um, but I said to the producer, I said, well, it's 100% up to you with what you want out of the film. I said, when, when it comes down to the dollars, you're not going to make less or more with either. Company. I said, but it, mm -hmm. it's completely up to you. What, what is it? What is it you want for your film? Is it, do, you, do you want to work with the distribution company? Do you want to just give it to them and let let them do their thing? Because because those are different things, and and neither of them are good nor bad. It's just they're just different. They're just different things. And believe me, I've come across producers who want the other thing. I mean, I know I'm talking to a group of producers right now who like the way we're doing things and with the boutique style thing, but I've talked to many producers who just, they, they don't give a shit about that. Like, they just they just want their film out there. No, 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 I just I just want to, uh, all I want is a list of platforms you're going to get it on, and that's all I care about. And and so, you know, those are the types of producers I always suggest that the, the you know, Dick's Distribution X company might be better for them. I said, because that's that's what they do that's what that's, that's their thing so so go with them you know and 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 then i come back to the you know do your research because ultimately 
um, you're going to be a re in a relationship with this with a distributor uh, once you sign the contract. You're going to be you're going to be in a relationship with them. And if you've told the distributor, like distributor X, that uh, you, you know you, all you want is your film out there on fifty fucking VOD platforms, you don't give a shit. And then you change your mind a year later. Well. You're no, there's no change in your mind, you know. Yeah. So you you have to put that thought in. You, you have to think about that stuff before you go into that. You, you Sorry, Vince. Very stuff. quickly. Yeah. Sorry, Vince. Would you say your approach is more of a niche approach compared to most? Uh, actually, I, in fact, I, I used to think that, but uh, in fact, I'm I'm finding that um, our audiences are not as niche as we once thought they were. They're a little bit right. more. There's there's a lot of us out there. Like I'm, I know that all of you know this. <laughs> so yeah. there's there's yeah. a lot of, there's a lot of us out there, and and I think that as um, as we're going on in life, a lot of the film buyers are now they're our age. They understand where we're coming from, and they understand that their clients are also uh, of this age group and and uh, can can be part of this audience of, of films that we're sharing. And uh, so, so actually, if you would ask me that question, honestly, six months ago, I would have said, yes, we're so we're super niche and blah, 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 but, but we carved, you know, we can find this niche and expose our films to it. But actually, no, I don't think that now. I think that the niche has become quite a bit more uh, commercial now. I really do think that. That's quite healthy. I think that ebbs and flows, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Like people suddenly kind of celebrate indie again, and then it kind of goes underground again, and then it comes out again. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Honestly, that that is the way it is, and and we all know that because again, you know that that picture that, that I got from this from this conversation for for this podcast uh, was like you know that that going into the video store and, and it, it wasn't supposed to be niche it was it wasn't supposed to be like oh this is a foreign film was it, it it just it was what it was and you had the cover art to judge the film by and that was it and the back of the box really the front and the back of the yeah. box you, ha you had that to judge the film they never even told you if it was dubbed or subtitled no. or from italy or from spain or from the u.s they never told you that it just it was no. this is the film this is what the film's about do you want to rent it Period. Well, they usually you know? had uh, Angl anglicized pseudonyms as well, like <laughs> Antonio Margarita became Anthony Dawson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then that that fooled that fooled us even further into thinking, oh, this is shot in New York. It's going to be an American film. <laughs> but but I but, but I would put to you this: when when we were young and we were renting these from video stores, did you know that when you rented Creep Show, it was a George A. Romero film? I would say no. You didn't know no, that. You rented it because it was cool, right? Yeah. And, and that's the thing. You looked into it after the fact. So, uh, like, I can't remember. I'm, I apologize. I can't remember who mentioned it, but somebody said it during this podcast. You ended up looking into these types of things after the fact as you got more engaged and uh, uh, in, in, into cinema, into cinema in general, you know. But, uh, That's it, anyway. exactly, you know, yeah. it's, 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 you, if you're that passionate, you start to pick up these uh, patterns and uh, yeah. styles and movements later on in life, you know, at first you're just there to be the consumer, yeah. you're there to be duped into this, that, the other, and you take, uh, you, you, you remember back uh, these times with glee, you know, <laughs> yeah. absolute joy. <laughs> well, that is a perfect yeah, way to, uh, to end the podcast. Thank you so much, guys, yeah. for doing this. It's been really awesome talking about this. I got completely consumed well, to just thank, listen. Thank you, it was too. awesome. I think we can. I think we can kind of. Um, we can all rest easy on the fact that I don't think hard copy is going to die too soon because, as, as as important and as relevant as VOD is, I think hard copy is always going to be there. You know, the, the love for it's always going to be. The, the demand's always going to be there. Yeah. Thank you so Long much for joining us, guys. <laughs> I, I do believe in that as well. Actually, like I, I do, I do believe in it. And uh, thanks, thanks so much, you guys. Uh, thanks for having me uh, be a part of this. Uh, Sam, thanks for coordinating this. Uh, it was really great. 
uh, for me to do this round table. And, you know, it, 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 you guys all brought up things that, that, uh, yeah, that, that have made me really, uh, you know, like triggered my thinking a little bit deeper into, into a lot of things, into every aspect of, of what it is we're all doing together. So I really appreciate that. Thanks, you guys. Like, likewise, thank you. it's really uh, nice to hear from you in person, you know, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's always good to hear from you, Lau, and it's always good to hear from you, Sam. Yes, Tom. So, it, it's lovely just, uh, speaking to you all, guys. Right, have a lovely evening, guys. I'm going to let you go on with the rest of your day. Yes. yes thank you. Thanks, guys. Speak have a great soon. Speak to you all. Take care. Bye. 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 Talk to you later. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Sam. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, yeah, so basically, please leave us a like. Leave us a comment. Um, if you want to share some of your distributing experiences, definitely leave a comment. Um, also, subscribe. And... Guys, next week is our penultimate podcast episode for season one. We're actually going to take a month off um, where we've got other film projects and stuff going on. And uh, yeah, so we hope you guys are listening, enjoying the stuff, and we look forward to you guys supporting us again come September. Other than that, Trash Arts Take Out. Take care of yourself, guys. Love. Peace. Bye.